let's first take a look at some of the major constituents. And this is figure 611, a pie chart from the book. And here we see that the most common element, or the most abundant element in the world ocean is chlorine. It makes up more than half of all the elements in the ocean. Now, of course, let's not be misled. This is a very small percentage on an average about 35 parts per thousand. So if you think of one part of something and then a thousand other parts, 35 parts are these major constituents because, of course, most of seawater is, yes, that's right, it's water. But of those dissolved elements, of those major constituents with a concentration greater than one part per million, chlorine rules. It's the number one. Sodium, not far behind at 30.6%, is the second most abundant element in seawater. And then in order of abundance, we have sulfur, magnesium, calcium, potassium, carbon, bromine, boron, strontium, and fluorine, making up the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 major constituents that we find in seawater in the ocean. Now, another important term that I'll use a lot and you'll hear used in oceanographic circles and sometimes even in auto mechanic shops is this idea of an anion, which is a negative ion. Again, when salt dissolves in water, it breaks apart into sodium and chloride. And the negative ion is called, the negative ion is called an anion. And again, it's the most abundant part constituent of seawater. The positive ion is called a cation. That's the sodium ion. And it's the second most abundant component that we find in seawater. Now, where might have you heard those words anion or cation or maybe anode and cathode before? Or positive and negative? Go look under the hood of your car. Therein you'll find the answer. Or in any electronic device. I remember anion because of A negative. The first two letters here. Anion has N for negative. And I remember cation because cats have paws. It's silly, but whatever it takes to help you remember these words, I'm willing to share with you. Of course, we've already said this. Together, they make sodium chloride, table salt, and when they're dissolved in seawater, they form sodium and chloride. Well, it's the presence of these ions in seawater, the positive charges and the negative charges of the sodium and chloride ions, that give it a very important property that's very useful for oceanographers. Just like a battery has a positive and negative charge that lets a current run through it, so too the ocean, with its negative and positive charge, lets an electrical current run through it. This property we call electrical conductivity. It should make some sense to you then that the more salts we have in seawater, the greater the current. Fresh water would have the lowest current because it doesn't have very many salts at all, or if any. And as we add more salts, we're going to get increases in the electrical conductivity. Well, it's this property that really revolutionized chemical oceanography because it allowed oceanographers to now measure the salinity or the saltiness of the ocean with an instrument that could measure electrical conductivity. Here's how they do it. If we have a particular salinity, and salinity is always reported, at least in, in this context in units of parts per thousand, we're going to have a particular conductivity. So you can see here as salinity goes up from 26 to 30 to 33 to 36, so too does the conductivity go up. And in this way, if we know what the conductivity is, we can easily figure out what the salinity is. For example, Let's say we go out on the ocean and we measure the conductivity as 50. So if we measure a conductivity of 50 out in the ocean, all we have to do is come down to our convenient chart and say, oh, the salinity is 33. Can you imagine in the olden days when they had to actually take samples of seawater and dry them out and then put them through some kind of chemical analysis to determine how salty the water is? That's a lot of work. Now all we have to do is stick a conductivity meter in the water 
and instantly we know the salinity of the ocean. So it allows us to measure great expanses of the ocean and determine its salinity, which as we'll see is a really important property for understanding ocean circulation. We'll learn about that in a little bit later time. As I said before, the instrument that we use to measure conductivity is called a conductivity meter. And this conductivity meter is an important part of an instrument introduced earlier called the CTD, which stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. <clears throat> Oceanographers also measure the conductivity, or they actually test their conductivity meter to make sure it's giving the correct answers on something called standard seawater. And believe it or not, there really is a, a company that makes seawater that's called standard seawater. And so that standard seawater, which is distributed all over the world, allows every oceanographer to stick their instrument in it and make sure that it's measuring the exact same result. And in doing that, we ensure that the measurements that are taken in one part of the world are equivalent to the measurements that are taken in another part of the world. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some of the trace elements in the ocean. And in many ways, the trace elements are more interesting. Well, they're more interesting to me because they tend to be uh, the ones that are used by organisms. And they're also some of the things that maybe we're more familiar with or uh, other than table salt. But these minor constituents or trace elements play a minor role, but they are still important biologically. We don't want to um, de-emphasize their importance just because we use the word minor. Many organisms in the ocean extract some of those trace elements to produce certain kinds of chemical defenses or toxins. The cone shell is a really good example. And if you can look up on the internet for a cone shell and do a little research on that, you'll be fascinated to find what this little snail can do. It has a really amazing poison that is composed of maybe a hundred different kinds of proteins and it's extremely deadly. It's very deadly to fish mostly, but if you were to hold one in your hand, well, it wouldn't be a very happy day for you. Let's put it that way. These cone shells actually though, by producing these toxins, which by extracting certain trace elements to produce those toxins, turn out not only to be a benefit for the organism, but a benefit for us as well because the toxin of cone shells is under intense study for its potential for relieving pain. Other kinds of elements or natural products from the ocean are under study for their anti-carcinogenic properties and other kinds of medical applications. So it's the ability of organisms to remove trace elements from seawater and create some of these amazing different kinds of toxins in this case, but also things that potentially have medical benefits that is an active area of research in oceanography today.